Warning, the content of this podcast may be disturbing and graphic. It may contain explicit details, discussions of crime scenes, and descriptions that some may find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. A note before we begin. This story is about a boy born with autism. It has historically been appropriate to use person-first language when referring to those with disabilities, especially for providers and others in the scientific community. This would mean saying something like, this person had paraplegia, not this person was a paraplegic. You see how the label of Paraplegic essentially says that this person is their disability. However, some, if not most, of the people in the autism community prefer the use of identity first language when speaking about autism. Those on the spectrum believe that it is something to be celebrated, not fixed. As autism is their identity, there is a strong preference for being referred to as autistic. As an occupational therapist myself, I am used to using person-first language, but out of the respect for the autistic community, the use of identity-first language will be used in this podcast. The decision to adopt a child is often made after much consideration Some people feel called to make a positive impact on a child's life and want to offer them stability, love, and opportunities they might not have had otherwise. Some couples turn to adoption as a means to expand their family when facing infertility issues. Choosing adoption requires patience, resilience, and an understanding of the unique needs and experiences of adopted children and the bond that forms between adoptive parents and their children is built on love, trust, and a shared commitment to creating a nurturing and supportive family environment. But what happens when a family decides they no longer want the child they've adopted? Some children will be placed back into a foster system to wait for another family to take them in. Some families will find a replacement family to adopt the child. But neither of these options appealed to Ernest and Heather Franklin when they decided they could no longer care for their adopted child, Jeffrey Franklin. They were about to have their own biological child. And so they decided they no longer had a need for Jeffrey. Instead of giving Jeffrey back or sending him to live with another family, they would choose a much more sinister way to erase him from their lives forever. This is the story of 16-year-old Jeffrey Franklin. Jeffrey Franklin, or JR, wasn't your average 16-year-old. Born to a deaf mother, he was autistic and was also born deaf. These circumstances would present Jeffrey and his family members with unique challenges. Autistic people often experience sensory difficulties and Auditory processing plays an important role in the processing of other sensory input, so being unable to hear would exacerbate these difficulties. JR struggled with communication and didn't learn much sign language. As you can imagine, 
Being unable to communicate effectively would lead to frustration, misunderstanding, and even social isolation. And JR's behavior reflected his frustration. This behavior made him difficult to care for, and he would end up living in three different homes before the age of 10. But Jeffrey was a happy child. He was into trains and cartoon characters. One picture of Jeffrey shows him wearing a Mario Halloween costume. He would wear the mustache from the costume to school and just about everywhere else for an entire month. That's the thing about JR. Despite his challenges, he had a great love of life. He had been living with his biological aunt and uncle for some time, and one day, his aunt asked him if he'd like to have a mother and father of his own. He would excitedly sign to her, yes. Soon thereafter, Jeffrey would be put into the foster care system with his new parents, Heather and Ernest Franklin. Heather Franklin was born in 1984 and grew up in Virginia Beach, Virginia. She married Ernest Franklin on April 2, 2011 in a small intimate ceremony at Madrona Tasting Room Winery in Shenango Forks, New York. Ernest Franklin grew up in Mount Upton, New York and studied at the State University of New York in Morrisville. Heather's Facebook page dates back to around 2010 and only contains a few photos from her wedding to Ernest and one adoption photo with Jeffrey. Ernest's Facebook page is an endless scrolling of posts from Farmville and other games, some very sexual, and songs from YouTube and some random ramblings about politics and farming equipment. It is known, though, that Heather had previously fostered children. She was a stay-at-home mom and homeschooled her kids. Ernest was an Iraqi war veteran. The couple lived in a double-wide trailer encircled by towering pines in the remote woods of upstate Guilford, New York. They were surrounded by farms and had several animals themselves, inside and outside. When the couple traveled, a neighbor, Dominic Gildersleeve, would often care for their animals. Heather and Ernest had been trying for years to conceive their own child, but they had been unsuccessful. Infertility can be an incredibly challenging and emotionally distressing experience for individuals and couples, and the stress and emotional burden can be debilitating. It can put an enormous strain on a couple's relationship. But Heather and Ernie were optimistic. They were about to adopt a child. This child was 11-year-old Jeffrey J.R. Franklin. He'd had his challenges, sure, but Heather and Ernie were sure that they could give him what he'd need, and in turn, he would give them what they had always wanted, the love of a child they could call their own. They would live together in New York and began raising Jeffrey with love and kindness. JR was particularly excited to be living with all of the animals. It looked like Jeffrey may have found the mother and father he had always hoped for. Heather, who knew ASL sign language herself, bonded early with Jeffrey. In a Facebook post from 2016, she excitedly wrote about taking JR to ride a train. Quote, JR went on a train ride tonight. All who know JR knows he loves trains. He was allowed to start the train too, and even rode in the locomotive for a while. And Brooks Barbecue was served on the train for dinner. Was a great family night, 
thanks to grandma and grandpa's birthday gift for JR. But behind closed doors, the facade of their happy family would crumble. Heather and Ernest were running out of patience for Jeffrey and his behavior. He was totally reliant on them. Not only did they have to manage his behavior and cognitive delays, but he had physical limitations too. And the day-to-day cares were beginning to wear on them. On February 23rd, Heather would voice her frustrations to a friend on Facebook. Been struggling with JR, she wrote. He is peeing in his room again for about the past two or three weeks, almost nightly. Last episode was last summer, so went a few months with nothing. Now he started it again. His room smells so bad. Every day it's the same thing cleaning pee. It's crazy. Then she wrote, I so badly want out. Dealing with J.R. peeing all over his room again for past few weeks. It punishes me more than him. And there was another thing. They had finally become pregnant with their own long-awaited biological child. On the night of February 28, 2017, when Jeffrey was 16 years old, Heather and Ernest finished up dinner and helped him to get ready for bed around 8.30. The couple then settled down for a night in on the couch, cuddling up and turning on an Oscar-winning movie. When it was over, Heather realized she had forgotten to pick up some of her pregnancy medication. She said goodbye to Ernie, grabbed the keys to their F-150, and disappeared down the road, through the trees, to the nearest Walmart. Ernie noticed that the night air had become increasingly colder, and he decided to start a fire. He picked up the pre-cut wood and placed it into the wood stove, lighting the kindling underneath. As he did so, one of his dogs nudged him, a clear sign that he needed to go out. So Ernie opened the door to the yard, but as he did so, their other dog pushed his way around Ernie and escaped into the night too. Frustrated, Ernie, leaving Jeffrey alone in his bed, grabbed the leashes for the two dogs and stepped into the brisk night to track them down. He spent some time in the woods searching, but once he found them and attached the leashes to the collars around their necks, he began the hike back home. As Ernest neared the home, a sooty fog filled his view and... Just under this fog, Ernie could see the unmistakable flicker of flames rising from the double wide that he'd left not all that long ago. He rushed toward the home. JR was in there, and this was not just a flicker of flame. It was a blaze. Realizing he needed to get help and fast, Ernie quickly ran to the home of his nearest neighbor and breathlessly asked her to call 911. Police were the first to arrive. 
a single figure appeared before them, a man, watching the blaze helplessly as they approached. The framing of the double-wide window was now visible, the house almost completely reduced to bare bones. Police body cams would capture the scene. In the video footage, you can hear the popping and crackling of the flames. And ashes rain down on the officer as he makes his way up the long, muddy driveway toward Ernest. Is everyone out? One officer yells to another. We got one in, the officer replies. In the back room. Ernest tells them that his son is inside the home, making it clear that the situation was extremely desperate. There's no way I can get inside, the officer says. Because the heat from the fire was so intense, officers could not get anywhere near the home. Firefighters arrive shortly after, and they heave the heavy water hose toward the flames. They initially have a difficult time establishing a line for the hose, but they are eventually successful, and because it was unsafe for them to enter the house, they begin to fight the blaze from the perimeter. Several yards away from the burning home, police begin to discuss the situation with Ernest Franklin. His voice is even keeled, and officers are surprised that he sounds unconcerned. He's not frantic, as you might expect someone to behave knowing that their child is trapped inside a burning building. Ernest tells them that Jeffrey had gone to bed around 8.30 or 9 that night and that he and his wife had watched a movie that ended around 10.30. He says that his wife had to leave to get some pregnancy meds. He started a fire in the wood stove shortly after, then let the dogs out. But instead of just one dog getting out, both escaped and he had to go after them. Ernest says that as he was coming back over the hill, that was when he saw the fire. It was all the way around the home. He tried to break the window of the room he knew JR was in, but he couldn't, it was too hot. So he ran over to the neighbor's house to have them call 911. As deputies listened to Ernest relay his story, they noticed that he had no burns himself. Usually people are burned, injured, or sometimes they even die trying to get to a loved one that is trapped inside a burning building. But Ernest had no signs of injury. That was odd. It was just another red flag in the officer's opinions. When the flames are reduced to ash and the scene becomes safe, firefighters begin to pick through the debris, a process they call de-layering. As a fire burns, pieces from walls and ceilings fall to the floor, and they have to remove all of this to uncover what is below. In the back room where Jeffrey had been, they pick through the sooty ruins. First, they uncover a set of bed springs that had once belonged to a mattress. Then, they discovered the charred, unmistakable remains of a human body. It was Jeffrey, and he was lying there as though he were still just sleeping. Investigators respectfully carry his body out of the wreckage, place him carefully into a body bag, and follow the hearse to the morgue. Almost immediately, investigations begin. At first, police interview Heather Franklin. She tells them that she left for Walmart around 11 that evening. Then she went to another store, the Price Chopper. While she's meandering around Price Chopper, she tells investigators she couldn't get this one certain baby blanket that she'd seen at Walmart out of her head. So she decided to return to Walmart to get it. 
when she arrived back home, that's when, quote, all hell broke loose and I came home to a nightmare. Heather was visibly upset and emotional during this interview, unlike her husband Ernest had been. Just days after the fire, she would share on Facebook that she was completely lost without JR. She requested the help of friends and neighbors, writing, quote, Many people have asked us what kinds of things we need. We have came up with a list of needs and or wants. Dominic Gildersleeve, the neighbor who would watch the Franklin's animals while they were away, set up a GoFundMe page for the couple, and donations began pouring in. Fire investigators would sift through the rubble to paint a picture of just how the fire had started, hoping to piece together the events of that evening and compare them to what they'd been told by Heather and Ernest in their interviews. By examining the type of combustibles and the construction of a home, investigators can scientifically calculate the burn rate of a fire. And this evidence was not lining up with Ernest's story about being gone for a short time just to get his dogs. A neighbor told investigators that at 12.07, they had looked toward the home and did not see any signs of a fire. At 1.14 a.m., the 911 call had gone out, with the entire house already engulfed in flames. Detectives interview the Franklin's neighbor, Dominic Gildersleeve. He tells them that he questions Ernest's behavior the night of the fire. Why did Ernest come to the neighbor's house to call 911 before trying to save his son? How far away could Ernest have been with those dogs to not see the massive blaze rising from the home? In Dominic's opinion, something wasn't quite right about the situation. He tells investigators, that he hasn't spoken with Ernest since the fire because Ernie had PTSD. Dominic was afraid that maybe something had triggered him and maybe Ernest had set the fire to cover something up. Dominic's suspicions might not have been so far-fetched. The medical examiner had completed the autopsy, and what he found was disturbing. There was an absence of soot in JR's trachea and bronchii. The level of carbon monoxide in his lungs was just 2%, which is a normal amount, an amount that could be found in yours or my lungs as we sit here breathing today. When someone dies in a fire, carbon monoxide levels in their lungs would be more like 60 to 85%. Jeffrey had been dead before the fire had started. The investigation quickly turned from a fire investigation to a homicide investigation. Detectives immediately suspect that Ernest Franklin was indeed involved with the death of his son. They speak with Ernest's parents first to gain some insight into what his life had been like. Ernest's parents tell detective that they'd only seen Jeffrey maybe five times total within the last six or seven years. It was clear they did not have a close relationship with their son. Ernest's father couldn't even tell investigators what he did in the army, although they knew that he'd been in for about a year and a half and had gone to Iraq. When he came home, they said, he would punch holes in the wall out of anger. This was concerning to police. It illustrated just how volatile Ernest's temper could be. Maybe he snapped and took his anger out on Jeffrey. When he'd realized what he'd done, 
Maybe he tried to cover it up by setting fire to the evidence. Police also interview Ernie's sister. She gives a little background into the adoption of Jeffrey and tells them that things started changing for the family around 2013, when the couple pulled him out of public school to begin homeschooling. Ernest's sister tells investigators that shortly after the fire, she'd overheard a disturbing conversation. The comment was made in a whisper. At first, she wouldn't tell investigators who had said it, Heather or Ernest. But finally, she told them. Ernest had whispered, quote, In a matter of minutes, $2,000 was gone. You see, the couple had been receiving a monthly stipend for caring for Jeffrey, but now that he was gone, they'd no longer be getting this money. Caring for Jeffrey had become a burden. With Heather newly pregnant, and with their own biological child on the way, maybe they didn't need Jeffrey anymore. Investigators confront Ernest with the results from the medical examiner's office. What do you think happened to Jay Arthur? Uh, I'm not telling you, I'm fired. Oh, I know. Okay, but we know that's not the case. Then I don't know. The, the ME can say, and, and he's been doing this for decades, he can say that he did not die in the fire. But people die in the fire, there's a lot of evidence. Yeah, sure. The, the bleeding in, right? And, and carbon monoxide in your blood builds up, and that's what kills you. It's not usually the heat, it's not the flames. It's smoke inhalation. Yeah. There's no smoke inhalation. Soot in your mouth. In your nose, and your trachea, and in your lungs, and a carbon monoxide level in your blood that's high. GR had none of that. He had no sun. He didn't breathe in any sun. And his carbon monoxide level is what? What? Or is right. Which indicates that he's not breathing in at the time the smoke gets to him. And the only reason he's not breathing in when the smoke gets there is because he's not breathing at all. He's already there. Something happened to GR. Something happened to JR, and then your house catches fire. Why would I burn my house down? To hide what happened to JR. Why would I kill him? I These things happen sometimes. It thinks way on you. I get that. We're both parents. We, we, you we do not understand what weighs on me. It, you're right. I'm not you. What, what I'm saying You don't even know why I got in the foster care. I don't. Why don't you tell me why? Because I shot a kid in Afghanistan. Mother and son. So one way I gave back was more foster care, and he came along. From day one, I wanted to adopt him. In case you didn't catch that, Ernest had told investigators that the reason he'd gotten into foster care in the first place was to give back, because he had shot a mother and son in Afghanistan. Detectives had already pulled Ernest's military records, though, and they knew that he had never actually seen combat when he was in the Army. This isn't going to go away, investigators tell him, but Ernest had had enough. He abruptly ended the interview by invoking his right to a lawyer. Ernest's alibi would be hard to prove, but police had time-stamped video footage to corroborate Heather's story. Even still, they believed that Heather knew something about the death of J.R., and they pressed her to admit it to them. He doesn't care about you, they told her. Only you can protect your unborn baby. Heather avoids the questions by deflecting them and even asks for frequent bathroom breaks to escape the interview. But police would return 
with a warrant to search the F-150 and her cell phone records. This search would prove to be a significant turning point in the investigation. Inside the F-150 was a GPS unit, a GPS unit that would have recorded Heather's every move on the night of the fire. It would show that she left her home right around the time she said she did. It showed her going to Walmart, but then the F-150 returns to the Franklin residence and it just sits there for five or six minutes. The GPS then shows that the F-150 drives to another store after that. This was a bombshell. Heather Franklin had indeed been complicit, somehow, in the murder of Jeffrey. With this, police arrest the pregnant mother and take her into custody. They also arrest Ernest and charge the two with second-degree murder. In 2017, while out on bail, Heather gives birth to a baby boy. In March of 2019, two years later, Ernest is convicted and sentenced to 21 years to life in prison. Just one month after that, Heather pleads guilty to the lesser charges of manslaughter and arson. After their arrests, those that donated to the GoFundMe page, which ended up totaling around $11,000, were told that their donations would be refunded. Later, it would be revealed that on the night of February 28th, the movie that Heather and Ernest had chosen to watch was the film Manchester by the Sea, a film in which the main character accidentally starts a fire that kills his child. He's not prosecuted for this because it was an accident. Just hours after watching this film, Jeffrey Franklin would be killed and the evidence would go up in flames. But Jeffrey's death was no accident and Ernest and Heather would be prosecuted. Unfortunately, we will never know how J.R. was killed that night. He was too badly burned. But it is clear that he did suffer in death and probably in life for months and years before at the hands of Heather and Ernest. Despite having good intentions, sometimes unforeseen circumstances lead to the realization that the match between a child and their adoptive family is not a good fit. Not every adoption story has a happy ending, but there are options when this happens. Options that don't involve murder. Heather and Ernest, however, saw no other way out and would choose instead to commit an unfathomable act, a decision that would leave one innocent child dead and another without his parents forever. <laughs> 